So as you can see, the title of our presentation is on uh, the benefits and challenges of volunteer-led uh, volunteer service provision. And I just want to let you know that Bernadine and I did volunteer for this session. Um, <laughs> but as the day has gone on, we have realised, yes, there's benefits to getting your presentation over and done with on day one, but there's certainly challenges doing it at six o'clock, five o'clock in the evening. <laughs> so bear with us and we'll try and uh, hold your interest and, as Jane says, not keep you too long. Um, so I suppose just to start off, volunteering matters. It matters in family support um, and it has increasing importance in family support. Um, but as the quote from Bill Clinton says um, and illustrates, volunteering can change lives. It can help young people, it can help children, it can help turn around the life of an adult, a child, a young person. Um, but like most things in life, volunteering is more nuanced. Um, it has benefits, it has challenges. Um, and I suppose today we're going to use two case examples, as Jane referred to, the Big Brothers Big Sisters programme and the Wizard of Words programme, to illustrate some of the benefits and some of the challenges that are involved in volunteer-led service provision. Um, just to put a little bit of context, and we're not going to get into any great detail in terms of you know, the definitions or the literature in relation to volunteering, but just to give a little bit of context, and certainly a little bit of uh, Irish context on volunteering in Ireland, um, the White Paper on Voluntary Activity defines volunteering as the commitment in time and energy for the benefit of society, local communities and individuals outside the immediate family and the environment and other causes. And I suppose that's very much where volunteering is at, as I say, within the Irish context. Um, Can and his colleagues uh, reviewed literature on the definitions of volunteering and highlighted four kind of key characteristics or key dimensions that's common to all uh, definitions on, on volunteering. And essentially those four characteristics are uh, that there's an element of getting freely involved, that you're freely given of your time. Um, there is no concern for financial uh, benefit or financial gain. Um, it can take many forms, but that generally there's some kind of process involved and there's some kind of structure involved. Um, and that there's benefits for individuals, for children, um, for society, for communities. We know, and I suppose we've, we've talked about it, you know, right through from Pat's presentation this morning, that volunteering increasingly has a prominent place within the public policy agenda. Um, you know, it, it, it certainly in the Irish context and elsewhere is getting more attention and has come more to the fore than ever before. It's recognised for its role that it can play in the creation of social capital, in promoting more inclusive society and in, in encouraging more active citizens. However, it's not a panacea for all ills. Um, and there is concern about the weight of expectation on the contribution that it can make, um, and that you know, is, is also the case in terms of the contribution that it can make, particularly in social <coughs> services and in human <coughs> services. So we'll talk a little bit, I suppose, when we talk about the challenges in volunteering, and uh, we'll keep that in mind, you know, that there is this debate around uh, you know, where it fits in terms of uh, its place and its role within service provision. In terms of volunteering and family support, um, it's not a new concept, it's not a new model. Um, Pat talked about the Kilkenny Incest Report being uh, 30 years old earlier. And certainly, you know, the tradition of voluntary aid and of um, volunteers providing help and caregiving goes, you know, it's an age-old tradition um, and was certainly in place, uh, you know, well back into the, the early uh, part of the century. Volunteering, as I say, it's not new within the family support. Um, you know, it can be traced back to philanthropy and to the provision of mutual aid. Um, Putnam, however, I suppose, refers to it as a communal activity that can strengthen uh, communities and help deliver services that perhaps would have been too expensive to provide um, or would have been underprovided, that there wasn't necessarily the resource or capacity uh, that volunteers can complement and enhance uh, the service provision that is, is already in place. So as I said, and the aim of this presentation is to explore both the benefits and challenges associated with volunteer-led service provision. And we're going to particularly focus on the perspective of the organisations who are delivering programmes and also on the experience for the volunteer. Um, so taking that kind of, you know, both perspectives in terms of the benefits and the challenges. And as we have referred to, we're going to draw on the research evidence from two volunteer-led programmes, both of which have, have been evaluated uh, by the Child and Family Research Centre here. So just quickly for those of you who aren't familiar with Big Brothers Big Sisters, um, it's a volunteer-led youth mentoring programme delivered by Faroga. Um, and basically young people aged 10 to 
10 to 18 years in need of support are paired with an older adult. They meet weekly for once a year. And essentially the aim of the programme is to make a positive difference uh, through a professionally supported one-to-one -one relationship with a caring adult. And the volunteer, as a big brother or a big sister, they're friends, they're, they're mentors, and they provide a positive role model for their little sister or little brother. Wizard of Words, again, for those of you who aren't familiar with the programme, uh, it's delivered by uh, Bernardo's. Um, it's a school-based volunteer-run programme. And essentially, eligible children in first and second class are paired with trained volunteers who are aged 55 plus, so over 55, for one-to-one -one weekly, uh, one-to-one -one reading sessions. Um, and the sessions last for about 30 minutes and happen three times weekly. So it's a very structured uh, literacy programme for uh, five, six and seven year old children. And the aim is to make improvements in the children's reading. So in terms of their comprehension, their fluency, their vocabulary building and their phonemic awareness. Uh, to encourage and promote their interest in and love of reading. And also to improve their perceived competence and enjoyment of reading. So a threefold uh, kind of approach to, to improving children's reading. So in terms then of the common features of both programmes, um, both are described and fall under the category of what we would call formal volunteering programme. You know, so there's a you know, very specific task, very specific structure attached. They're both overseen by professional staff. They both involve rigorous assessment and vetting of volunteers. There's a very structured, rigorous process attached to uh, recruitment and selection of volunteers. Um, and they're both based on evidence-based models from <coughs> the US. Uh, Big Brothers, Big Sisters America, and the Experience Core Programme in the case of Wizard of Words. And as I said, they've both undergone rigorous evaluation uh, in the Irish context, conducted here by the research team within the, the centre. So in just in terms of the, the, the evaluation and the research design that was um, applied to both programmes, both were mixed method uh, research designs. Both involved a randomised control trial conducted over two years, and both involved then an evaluation of the programme implementation. So there was both a quantitative and a qualitative aspect to the research. And the qualitative part of it um, included interviews and focus groups and so on with all key stakeholders, but particularly, and I suppose of, of interest to this presentation, with the volunteers who were involved in delivering the programme. And I suppose the, the, the findings in this presentation and that the presentation is based on um, that qualitative data that was gathered from uh, the volunteers. Um, we also have uh, uh, the view of children and young people, but in the main, we're focusing on the um, experience of, of the volunteers. So we're going to move on and talk about the benefits of the volunteer-led service provision. I'm going to hand over to Bernadine to talk about the benefits, and then I'll come back in to look at some of the challenges. Hello, everybody. Um, it's very nice to have a chance to um, take part in this conference. So. Um, Thank you very much. Um, so as Carol said, I'm going to focus on the benefits of volunteer-led service provision and family support. So I'm going to look at them from a number of different perspectives. Firstly, from the organisational perspective, then from the volunteers, um, and also the children and young people, and finally, just briefly, about from the community perspective. Um, so just to start with the, I suppose, the benefits for organisations from, from volunteer-led service provision. Um, Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, that's it. Yeah, so firstly, I suppose the first benefit, I'm going to highlight four benefits for organisations. The first one is around needs and being able to target needs. So Carmel referred to the quote from Putnam earlier about, I suppose, voluntary-led models enabling organisations to address needs maybe that wouldn't otherwise be addressed and so on. So I suppose what we found in the case of both organisations that we're looking at today is that um, they both had identified a very particular need um, that wasn't being addressed at that point in time <coughs> or was being under-addressed at that point in time in their organisation. And the, the volunteer model, led model, offered an opportunity, I suppose, to address those particular issues in a more comprehensive way. So in the case of Feroiga, um, at the time when it set up Big Brothers, Big Sisters, it was, I suppose, primarily engaged in project work and its locally based youth clubs for young people and so on around Ireland. But it was finding an increased demand for one-to-one -one work with young people rather than group work. Um, a demand for group work as well, but also an increased demand for one-to-one -one work. So because the ethos of the organisation was around supporting and empowering the community to look after its own young people, it kind of, I suppose, took the step of looking 
and exploring the possibilities of one-to-one -one models of supports involving volunteers. So from that point of view, it arose from a very de definite and particular need that the organization had. Similarly, in relation to Bernardo's, they, um, at the time, were developing a new strategy, and among the objectives they wanted to target was to improve um, young people's education and achievement. And one particular um, issue they were concerned with was the gap in reading achievement between advantaged and disadvantaged children. Even when they started school, it was apparent, and the gap became wider then as they went through school. So they particularly wanted to target that, and they saw a volunteer-led model as a way of, I suppose, resourcing and targeting that particular need that otherwise wouldn't be addressed. So from that point of view, I suppose, voluntary-led models can, I suppose, enable innovation and um, particular needs to be addressed that, that would otherwise be underserved. Um, I suppose the second point in relation to benefits is around resources. And to put it into plain English, really, um, in terms of using the resources that are available to the organization, through using volunteers, you can reach more children and young people than you would um, just using professional staff alone. So for instance, in the case of Big Brothers Big Sisters, if the professional staff were to offer one-to-one -one support to young people, they'd be able to reach an awful lot less than a professional staff person supporting a team of volunteers who in turn support young people. So the reach of the organization is greatly enhanced um, by, that, by, by working through, through volunteers. Um, and Pat's, the title of Pat's presentation this morning was about untapped potential, and I suppose um, these types of models draw that untapped potential out of the woodwork, if you like, that there's an awful lot of um, capable um, volunteer, adult volunteers, potential volunteers out there that um, when these models are designed and developed, that they're drawn into the, to the field, if you like, to give their, channel their resources for the benefit of children and young people. So from that point of view, they're, they're um, I suppose, <coughs> drawing in resources into the organization that they, they otherwise wouldn't have access to. I suppose the third point, and I think this is a really important point, and it kind of distinguishes um, volunteer-led provision from more professionally-led provision, it's the kind of qualitative dimension of what volunteers can offer maybe that professional staff don't have time um, or space maybe to offer as much. And that's the luxury of time and space for a one-to-one -one relationship. So both of these models are based on the concept of the value of a one-to-one -one relationship and the value of that in a child's life. So be it around reading support or be, in, be it around friendship, just to be there as a friend for, for a young person for a year or more. So I suppose the theory of change underpinning both programs is around the value of that relationship um, and the, the benefits that accrue from that. Um, and I suppose, you know, there's been, a, in the literature around children's service provision, there's a lot of, um, I suppose, criticism of the direction maybe the services have taken um, in recent years through modernization and everything, that there's less and less time for professional staff to spend that kind of quality time with um, children, young people, and families, whereas volunteer models actually can carve out that space um, and create that space for that relationship to happen. Um, like Ferguson O'Reilly say, modern service provision leaves little room to address issues that are emotional, irrational, and expressive, whereas models like this, where the volunteers are assigned to one person alone for a prolonged period, up to a year or more, um, offer that, that kind of, you know, can give attention to that emotional and messy side of, of things as well. Um, the other point about that, I suppose, the qualitative dimension of the relationships is that the fact that, as Carmel said, those volunteers aren't paid, young children and young people know that and they appreciate that and that gives it a different feel. So the relationships have a more authentic feel. Um, and I suppose that all the body of evidence in relation to support and social support for children and young people um, shows that they prefer, as we all do, um, informal social sources of support. So these c types of provision can more, I suppose, effectively replicate what people would have in their own lives, um, or that they, they, you know, if their own networks were able to provide it, that's the kind of support they'd like to have. So from a qualitative point of view, I think volunteer-led models can really bring an added value to 
to um, the range of service provision. The fourth point then is about outcomes, because I suppose all that I've said so far is all very well, but what if they don't work, you know, or what if they don't make a difference? But I suppose there's an increasing body of evidence that these programs do make a difference, and Andy talked about some of it earlier as well. Um, so I suppose in our studies, both studies found evidence of positive outcomes in both underwent randomized control trials, which is this, the highest level of evidence, um, causal evidence possible whereby a group receiving the intervention is compared to a group that doesn't receive it and their outcomes are tracked over two years. So in the case of WELL, um, the, the, the group of children who received the reading program or took part in the reading program had stronger outcomes in relation to word recognition, phon phonemic awareness, phonic knowledge and reading self-beliefs and I'm sure you all know what they are because um, we all do. But, um, and they also, they were statistically significant improvements and they also had gains in reading accuracy. They weren't statistically significant, but positive trends. Similarly, in Big Brothers Big Sisters, there was statistically significant evidence of outcomes in relation to emotional well-being and the young people's perception that there was somebody there to support them. Um, and there was positive trends, again, not statistically significant, um, but the, the well-being and social support were, but the drug and alcohol use and attitudes to education Again, if we had bigger samples, we possibly would have seen statistically significant findings there. So in relation to both programs, they have been found to do what they say on the tin. They, they have been found to be effective. So, and I suppose just in terms of even young people's feedback about the programs, they're popular, they're well received. Um, Big Brothers Big Sisters is a very, very popular program. There's a lot of demand for it. Young people spoke of having fun in our research, being happy, being more confident, being more hopeful for the future. So the qualitative feedback kind of mirrors the, the quantitative findings. Um, they reported better relationships with their parents and with peers. So again, just the simple fact of having an adult volunteer to take them out for a couple of hours once a week reduced pressure on their relationship with the parent. They were in better form. They were looking forward to it. They were in good form afterwards. And conflict in the family was reduced. And as many of you know, that um, parent-child relationship is one of the critical influences on children's well-being. So the, the intervention actually worked, works. The theory <laughs> underpinning it is that it also works through that improved parent-child relationship as well as the direct relationship from the child. Um, and I'd just, um, just like to note as well that the relationship with the Froge caseworkers was also a very positive influence on the young people because they tend to get to know the young people in, you know, in the program very well as well. They have a very positive influence too. So you can see from the quotes there that um, they were just a sample of some of the, the, the things that young people said about it. Similarly, in relation to WOW, um, children reported increased enjoyment of reading um, in the reading club and in class. And many of these children possibly wouldn't be read to at home and things like that. So it, it was the first time maybe that um, they got a chance to get out of the formal environment of the classroom and to just relax, get to know an older volunteer around some, and to see reading and books in a positive light. They were happy, said they were happier to read aloud. They enjoyed trying out new words and games. They liked chatting with their reading ladies, or man as they call them, and they were more confident in attempting new words. So again, you can see just some of the quotes um, from the children to, to, to express that. So you can see there, for, like from an uh, organiza organizational point of view, volunteer-led provision brings an awful lot of benefits. It can t it's a cost-effective way of targeting identified needs. Um, and you know, it, in, where evidence is available, it tends to point that a lot of, of these types of programs are effective. But in terms of benefits for volunteers then, what's in it for them? Do they just kind of give everything and end up exhausted or do they get something out of it too? Well, I suppose I just want to look at six, looking across both studies and the literature we have, six kind of types of benefits were evident from, from talking to the volunteers. I suppose a lot of them, the main kind of benefit that they expressed or that they said they got out of involvement in the program was around having the opportunity to express their values around wanting to support children and young people, uh, around altruism, and that they got satisfaction from giving back. And I suppose, again, the fact that it's a one-to-one -one program, they can see the benefit, that the change that they're making in that one child or young person over the course of a year or beyond. 
So they actually get to see it in their own eyes. So you can see from the quotes there, like one of the BBBS volunteers said that just, I just get simple satisfaction out of seeing the kid being happier. It doesn't really come down to much more than that. So, you know, they, um, for a lot of volunteers, that was the reward that they got from it. Just a second point. Um, there was a lot of cases where the specifics of the program actually mirrored the interests or the outlooks of the volunteers. So, for example, one WOW volunteer said she loves books and would hate to think of somebody to leave school without being competent in reading. So the programs kind of enabled um, volunteer, particular adults to channel their altruism in ways that, that match their own interests and beliefs. Um, and also the specifics of the program maybe appealed to a lot of people. The fact that it was one-to-one, -one, um, like one BBBS volunteer said they liked the fact that it was one-to-one, -one, they could make a big difference to one person rather than a little difference to a lot of people, which would be the case in volunteering in the case of group work or something like that. So um, the specifics of these programs, again, when you talk about um, the untapped potential, there are possibly people who wouldn't have volunteered for maybe more generic or general type <laughs> group activities, but these type of one-to-one -one models attracts them and appeal, has appeal for them, so they, they, they um, you know, it mirrors their values and their interests. The, a third benefit, and um, I suppose again it ties in with what Connie was talking about earlier, is around values and kind of um, empathy and just learning, I suppose, through engagement with other people that our own preconceptions are challenged and I suppose we develop empathy and insight into other people's lives. So that was a strong finding coming across from the volunteers that they felt they had a lot more empathy and that they were more educated, I suppose, about what life was like for children and young people living in difficult circumstances. Um, a fourth benefit then was the friendship and social support they got from meeting other volunteers. So I suppose there was a lot of like-minded people um, engaged in the same work, so it was a whole new social outlet for people. Um, particularly in the WOW volunteers who were all older, maybe retired um, people, and it was a chance to get out of the house and meet other people, and a lot of them enjoyed the camaraderie associated with that. And similarly, in Big Brothers Big Sisters, they really valued from when they met other mentors in group activities and so on. But the friendship also came from meeting with the young people themselves and the children and young people. So, um, and I suppose a feature of kind of authentic um, relationships is that they're reciprocal, you know, that there's benefits in it for both parties. Um, and that very much came across, particularly in the BBBS research where, the, where it was more of a, of a friendship type relationship. Um, but like this quote from the BBBS volunteer, he went into the program thinking, he was going to help somebody and that, you know, that was his main motivation. But it never really occurred to him that he'd get something out of it. But he said he gets great enjoyment hanging out, particularly the music. Um, so in a lot of cases, mentors or volunteers actually develop new skills based on what the young people were interested in because they went and did things together. And the young people could actually show them things and there was cases of, um, you know, young people showing volunteers how to swim and play music and do different things. So, and this, this guy also said, you know, it's just time out for him. He's had a really busy job, whereas this was a couple of hours a week that he knew he'd just get out and play music or do whatever the case may be, and he really enjoyed that. So it was um, an unintended benefit in his case and, and in other cases similarly. And the final one then is just, um, I suppose, the, at various stages of the life cycle, you know, people have different needs, and volunteering can meet some of those needs. So, you know, there were cases of volunteers and Big Brothers Big Sisters maybe who were starting out in their career, maybe wanted to get into social care, social work type professions, and they, um, this was an opportunity to develop skills in that way, you know, and, and to um, gain a competitive edge maybe in that regard. And then similarly for the WOW volunteers, it was when maybe when their children had left home, it was something to do. So I suppose the point was that, that the vol volunteering role gave them an opportunity to fill, address needs or gaps that they had in their lives at various stages of their lives. So just in terms of this, you know, summing up the, what motivates the volunteers, it's really a, a kind of a mixture of dispositional factor, factors, as in factors intrinsic to the person themselves, their own values and altruism, maybe wanting specifically to help children or young people, 
the fact that they have time on their hands, that they need something um, in their lives. Uh, but it's also organisational factors where it were really important as well. So the fact that both Bernardo's and Faroga are reputable national voluntary organisations was reassuring for them that they felt that their time would be well used. The one-to-one -one nature of provision, as I've said, appealed to a lot of people that maybe wouldn't have been attracted to other types of, of provision. The structured professional approach kind of reassured them that you know, they wouldn't be left high and dry or left with a difficult situation that they couldn't handle, that there was support there on hand and that it was all managed well. Uh, and the flexible time commitment was, was also a benefit. So um, I suppose just reflecting on what volunteers get out of it and so on, there's a lot of talk maybe nowadays about, you know, are people, uh, with society becoming more individualized and so on, are people likely to volunteer less because, you know, they're more interested in their own interests and so on. But I suppose Hustings and Lamerton there argue that um, it's not that people are less altruistic or that they've less solidarity, but that they maybe want to express it in different ways and that they still want to volunteer, but they maybe approach it in a more consumerist way in that they look at what they want to get out of it and what way they want to tailor it. Um, so they still want to do it, but that to do it in a way that suits and fits in with their life and their own identity and so on. And we saw that, I suppose, in our research that people are quite reflective about the benefits they get out of it and the difference they're making and so on. And they like to be able to see that difference that they're making. So, um, so I suppose that uh, is reassuring for the future of volunteering that it's just kind of inventing itself or adapting um, to society as, as it evolves. Um, the last thing I just want to look at before I hand you back to Carmel, um, who I have all the positive things to talk about. Poor Carmel then has to go and talk about all the difficult things, so um, I get to, to do the easy stuff. But um, I suppose just to look about benefits for communities, because I suppose this all aggregates up, if you like, into benefits for communities. Um, and again, going back to Connie's presentation this morning, it, you know, it shows, programs like this show children and young people that their community has an interest in them. It gives them a, um, a model, like I remember there was a quote from one young person in Big Brothers Big Sisters, and she said, um, it, gives you an, uh, it gives you a picture of a person who cares. You know, so it's showing them role models of, of people who care. Um, it's, I suppose, Contribute, contributes to social capital, I suppose if we understand social capital as being part of social networks, having trust in others and having a connection to community, um, it does those things for children and young people and also for volunteers, so it's, it's building those kind of connections and trust. Um, and I'd argue as well that um, the, the programmes help create mentor-rich communities, so you kind of have the fact that people go through this training and do these types of, take part in these types of programs, like I said, they're much more empathetic and attuned to children and young people in general. So they're more likely to look out for them. So um, Big Brothers Big Sisters also have a school-based program, which we didn't go into in detail, but it matches first-year students with older students in secondary schools to help ease the transition to secondary school for the younger students. But we also did research on that program and an interesting thing that came out of that study was that um, the principals and teachers reported that the, the benefits of the program went beyond the one-to-one -one match that was between the older student and the younger student. They, they reported that the um, older students, once they had been kind of empowered to take on that leadership role around looking out for younger students, they tended to do that on a day-to-day -day basis in the school in relation to the other students, you know. So, they, once they had almost been given permission and sensitized to the fact that younger people had needs, um, they were more likely to act on that in the day-to-day, -day. and as they, they really found that it enhanced the overall school community. That, you know, and as, as um, more and more people came into the school and the program was running year after year, that kind of culture of looking out for people became embedded in the school. So equally, in, in kind of communities, the more volunteers are involved in these types of programs, the more that kind of culture can become embedded in, in communities. So as I say, I'll, I'll hand you back to Carmel, and um, she's going to look at the, the challenges. Thank you.
So we'll move on to look at the challenges. As Bernadine said, uh, you know, there's a lot of positives involved in, in volunteering, but there are certainly difficulties and challenges that have to be faced both uh, by the volunteers themselves and also by the service provider, by the organisation. So I'm going to stick with volunteers for now and just look at the challenges for the volunteers. And again, based on the research that we did on Big Brothers, Big Sisters and on WOW. I suppose the first uh, challenge that um, volunteers spoke of is the time commitment. And I suppose that the availability of volunteers to commit on an ongoing basis to a programme is a significant issue for any volunteer-led programme. Um, and essentially what you need is manageable time commitment so that you know, the, the time commitment is manageable and that the volunteer is attracted in the first instance to a programme that, that requires a manageable time commitment and also then for, for kind of the sustainability and the maintaining of the volunteer within that programme that it continues to be manageable within their kind of regular life and, and their other responsibilities. Um, another challenge that the volunteers spoke to us about was I suppose their sense of obligation and they really felt strongly and deeply that the programme depended on their turning up every week or turning up every day. Um, you know, so there was a strong kind of feeling that they didn't want to let the child or the young person down, they didn't want to lead, let the organisation down, and that they were very committed to, to being involved and being part of this programme. Um, and associated that with that was a very strong sense of, of responsibility. And um, that you know, if they didn't turn up on a given day, well then essentially the programme didn't run. The literacy support didn't happen or the mentor relation didn't happen. So there was a very strong kind of obligation in, indicated amongst the volunteers that we spoke to. Um, and, you know, and again, I suppose it's you know, maybe not something that the volunteer would necessarily have thought of so deeply prior to getting involved in, in these type of programmes. Um, the skills and knowledge required were specifically highlighted by the WOW volunteers. I suppose WOW is a very technical, a very detailed literacy support programme. As we referred to earlier, you're looking at areas of reading comprehension, of fluency, of phonemic awareness, um, and a vocabulary building. So there's quite a level of skill and quite a level of knowledge required by the volunteer in instilling that and supporting the child uh, to learn those, those skills. Um, and really, I suppose that the, the WOW volunteers, as this quote illustrates, they really, I suppose, didn't realise the, the level of skill and the level of knowledge um, that would be required when they first got involved in the programme. Um, and I suppose it's a testimony to the volunteers that they, they, you know, they stuck with it and they learned and they, they, they took on board all they needed to take on uh, in order to be able to instill that knowledge and impart that knowledge to the children that they were reading with. Forming the relationship with the child or the young person was, again, a very significant challenge for volunteers in both programmes. And there was, I suppose, specific aspects and different aspects to the relationship forming uh, process that, that the volunteers spoke about. And particularly the Big Brothers Big Sisters volunteers spoke about their concern and their, um, I suppose, fear that they wouldn't be able to form a relationship with their young person in the first instance, that they wouldn't have a connection, that they wouldn't have something in common with them, that they wouldn't be able to, you know, build some type of rapport between them and the young person. And it was a very real fear and a very real concern, um, you know, that they just wouldn't get on with their, their adolescent um, little sister or, or, or big sister. Protecting that space for a personal relationship, you know, the space that, that Bernadine talked about. So as we said, one of the attractive features was that the volunteer was able and was allowed, was given the permission to form kind of a friendly, personable, real relationship with the child or the young person. I suppose they had a concern about being able to, you know, allow that relationship to develop, have a normal kind of friendly relationship with them, but also stick to the task at hand, to be the mentor, to be the positive role model, or to get the literacy support done. So again, it was just, you know, a concern, could they manage both? Had they the skill and expertise, uh, you know, to form the relationship, but stick to the task at hand at the same time? And for volunteers in both programmes, there was very real concerns about the possibility of a child protection issue or a child protection concern um, arising with the child or the young person that they were volunteering with. Um, and I suppose in both programmes, volunteers were very well trained and very well supported in relation to child protection concerns and what to do if, if, you know, if there was, if one arose. Um, but for volunteers before they got involved with the programme and in their initial stages of involvement with both programmes, it was a very real concern, particularly for volunteers who weren't experienced in working with children and young people, where this was a whole new uh, world for them. 
um, you know, both working with the new person and what to do if there was a child protection issue. So that was a very real, I suppose, and a, a kind of a fairly daunting concern uh, for volunteers to have to contend with, as I say, both before they got involved and in their, the initial stages of being involved in, in both programmes. The social circumstances that the children lived in, um, again, was, I suppose, a challenge and a concern for volunteers. And there was very much, I suppose, a, a kind of a sense of, um, you know, that they were powerless to address a lot of the deprivation or a lot of the disadvantage that many of the children involved in the programmes uh, lived in. Um, you know, so there was, I suppose, a concern that really the, what they were providing was only a drop in the ocean in terms of the circumstances and the experiences that the child or the young person uh, had to live with. Um, and also, I suppose, again, specific to the WOW volunteers, the, the low level of literacy um, and the level of need that was there for literacy support and reading support, again, was a you know, very real and significant concern for volunteers. Um, and as the quote illustrates, you know, they were, I suppose, were daunted by the fact that so many children uh, in these schools and disadvantaged communities were having such serious difficulties with their literacy and with their reading. Um, and again, felt, you know, was what they were doing enough? And what about the child who wasn't attending WOW well and wasn't receiving the literacy support? Were they going to leave school without being able to read? And again, you know, very concerned and I suppose feeling very um, bothered about that. So in terms of challenges for the organisations then, so just to think, I suppose, from uh, a more uh, organisational and a more structural point of view, you know, what are the, I suppose, the challenges that arose for both Faroga and for Bernardo's, expected and unexpected, in, in providing the, the volunteer-led programme? So recruiting volunteers, I suppose, both programmes uh, found out pretty quickly that recruitment is a very time-intensive and labour-intensive task. Um, it involves, you know, widespread kind of large-scale advertising and publicity campaigns um, you know which as I say are time and labor intensive and essentially there's a need to have adequate numbers of volunteers on an ongoing basis so there's this constant need to uh, supply the adequate number of volunteers to meet the demand and um, so the recruitment process is an ongoing kind of ever-present rolling um, task for the for the organizations to ensure that they, they meet demand as I say so there were some then very specific issues in relation to recruiting volunteers um, for both programmes. The geographical spread became an issue, um, particularly in the rural communities where the, the kind of the pool of potential volunteers wasn't as great as what was needed, um, where the likelihood that the volunteer might know the child or the young person already was an issue, um, or where maybe some of the local knowledge or relationship between families um, you know, kind of mitigated against the possibility of a match that could be made between uh, a big brother or a big sister and the, 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 the young person. Um, and also poor and non-existent public transport became an issue. So, you know, in the rural areas, it was a necessity that the volunteer then had their own transport. So very practical, very real issues um, became kind of you know, prevalent um, when, when the organisations were trying to recruit adequate numbers of volunteers. The other issue that was a very real concern for the organisations was in relation to the gender mix, and particularly for the Big Brothers Big Sisters programme, where uh, little sisters are matched with big sisters and little brothers are matched with big brothers. Uh, you know, there needed to be a, 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 an adequate supply of male volunteers. Um, and as we have here, the research shows that more women than men volunteer, um, and furthermore, more women than men volunteer in kind of human services or social services or caring services. Men are more likely to volunteer in sporting organisations. So for Big Brothers Big Sister, where they needed an adequate supply of male volunteers, that was a very kind of real and a very serious issue for them. Um, and part of their strategy was that they approached or focused their, their recruitment strategy on uh, you know, the GEA and the rugby um, football clubs to ensure and to try, you know, to try and... Uh, gather as many male volunteers as they could. It wasn't such an issue for WOW, because um, the, the, mat, the, the match, uh, you know, uh, older ladies read with um, young boys, but again, Bernardo's wanted to have, I suppose, positive male role models for both uh, the young boys and the young, the young girls, so they did uh, strive to have um, male volunteers as well. So in terms of recruiting volunteers, I suppose the, the overall learning was that the, the recruitment strategy needs to be very focused. And I suppose the more, um, the, the higher the level of commitment and the more focused the programme and the more task-orientated the programme you're trying to deliver, 
Um, and the higher the degree of time commitment and the higher the level of skill or involvement that's required, then the more focused and the more uh, targeted your recruitment campaign needs to be. If you're involved or if you require larger numbers of volunteers, which maybe there isn't the same level of commitment or there isn't the same level of involvement or skill or knowledge base required, and um, then a more broad-based kind of general recruitment strategy works. But for these very specific, very focused um, programs, we, you need to have a very focused kind of strategic uh, recruitment strategy. Um, retaining volunteers then is, I suppose, every bit as complex as motivating volunteers to get involved in the first instance. And this is something you know, that both organisations uh, pretty quickly learned that you know, they needed to really, I suppose, pay attention to how to sustain the volunteers within the organisation, how to ensure that, uh, you know, that retention of volunteers didn't become uh, a big issue. The research shows that reasons for discontinuing uh, volu your volunteering includes feeling, feelings of being undervalued and or overburdened, uh, being inadequately trained, supervised or managed. And I suppose it, you know, the, the research shows that uh, you know, attrition rates can be quite high in volunteering organisations um, and it's because of these reasons. And Locke and his colleagues, I suppose, identified that there was no factor X um, as to why some volunteers continue and others withdraw. And essentially, they went as far as to say that, you know, that there's no point even looking for this uh, factor X, that it doesn't exist, that it, you know, it's, it's so difficult to um, you know, appreciate and understand why some volunteers will continue and others with, will withdraw. <coughs> So I suppose from the Big Brothers Big Sisters and from the WOW um, perspective, a lot of attention went into supporting, supervising and training volunteers. And I suppose this was an effort obviously to ensure that they were trained and up for the task and so on, but also to ensure that they were valued, that they were part of the organisations um, and that they were supervised and supported within their work. Um, and the, the, the need for this organisational support um, and its contribution to the role of volunteers has been extensively researched and extensively uh, documented. And there's a very clear and a very strong connection between the level of support, the type of training, the quality of training, um, and then the, the corresponding commitment of the volunteer to the organisation that they're, they're volunteering with. So in the case of Big Brothers Big Sisters and WOW, there was a very low attrition rate amongst the volunteers. Um, you know, and I suppose thankfully for both organisations, uh, that was the case that once uh, people signed up and volunteered and committed, uh, you know, that they, they, um, they, they maintained that commitment and they, they stayed for as long as they, they intended to stay. Um, and I suppose there was very high satisfaction rates amongst both groups of volunteers with the supervision, with the training, with the support that they received. Um, with the level of participation and involvement within the organisation, and they very much felt that their effort was uh, valued, that their input was valued, um, and that they were an appreciated and an integral part uh, of the organisation and of the programme uh, and service delivery within the organisation. So in terms of just, I suppose, pulling those points together, I mean, very much the, the challenge for the organisation based on, on the research and literature that's there, but I suppose mostly based on our own research, is, I suppose, the need for the, you know, very high quality supervision and support and very high quality training, which is, you know, task-centred, so that it's appropriate and responsive to the need of the particular uh, programme and, and the volunteers within the, the particular programme. So once an organisation can provide that high level of, of supervision and support and training, um, it allows the, the volunteer to identify with the organisation, it allows them to become involved um, you know, and to feel part of and included in. Um, and as a result of that, the, the volunteer is able and is supported to build the relationship that Bernadine was talking about earlier. They can build the relationship with the child or the young person. They feel confident, they feel skilled, they feel supported to do that. And as a result, they can then also perform the tasks that they're required to do. So whether that's providing a, a, a mentor or a positive role model, or whether it's, it's providing the literacy support, uh, the volunteer feels supported, they feel trained, they feel confident, they feel equipped, and they feel part of the organisation, so they can do that with comfort and with ease. And as a result of that, the outcomes are achieved, both for the child or the young person, for the volunteer who feels that they're making a positive contribution and that the child is benefiting from their time and their commitment and their involvement, and also for the organisation, for the service providers, uh, you know, that the intended and desired outcomes of the programme are being achieved. 
So I suppose overall, if those components are in place, if they're trained, if they're supervised, if they're supported, they become ident they identify with the organisation, they become involved, the tasks are, are achieved and the outcomes are achieved. And as a result of that, the volunteer continues to give their time and effort. So they stay and they, you know, essentially, uh, they continue to volunteer. So it's, I suppose, very much, you know, a kind of a, um, a multifaceted approach to retention and to ensuring that the volunteer um, remains with the organisation. So just the last two challenges for the organisation then. Um, funding, I suppose, no, the volunteer-led programmes, uh, you know, similar to any other programme, are not without costs. Um, obviously, there's a cost associated with recruitment, with training, with all that support that's required, with program management, with program material, and so on. And I suppose the more formal and the more structured the program and the more specific it is in its nature, uh, then the higher the associated costs are. Um, and I suppose it's, it's um, so just to say that both BBBS and WOW, um, as Berndine referred to earlier, both have evidence that they are achieving their intended outcomes. Um, but both are having ongoing funding issues. So, again, I suppose in this time of austerity, even though uh, both are proven effective programmes, uh, they're having funding uh, difficulties. And I suppose the challenge for organisations is, you know, particularly with pilot programmes or programmes that aren't part of their, their mainstream service provision, uh, the challenge is to, to continue to, to find funding and to provide the funding for such services. So there's also a challenge for organisations, uh, increasingly so, and again, when they're not part of the mainstream service provision, to prove that the services are effective and that the, the programme is achieving its desired outcomes. Um, and for Big Brothers, Big Sisters, and for WOW, the service providers were interested in knowing, you know, was the programme effective, was it a, a achieving its intended outcomes? The volunteers, crucially, are also very interested in knowing is their contribution making a positive difference? Is their time and effort making a difference positively to the child or the young person that they're involved with? And then funders also obviously want to know if the programme that they're funding is, having, uh, you know, uh, is effective, is making a positive contribution. So I'm going to wrap up. I don't know how we're doing for time. Um, so just some, I suppose, concluding points and key messages to take home. Uh, based on, I suppose, you know, kind of our, our, our learning from the research on both programmes. Volunteer-led provision can enable family support services to identify, to address identified needs in a cost-effective way. So as Bernadine referred to, I mean, we're talking about, you know, very specific needs that were identified by both organisations, and it has been successfully proven that both of the volunteer-led programmes can meet and can uh, respond to those needs in a very cost-effective way. We have evidence that the child and the young person um, and that the volunteers derived enjoyment and positive benefits from their participation within the programmes. So we can conclusively say um, you know, that it was a positive experience for the child, that the uh, outcomes were achieved and that it was a positive experience for the volunteers. And this mirrors uh, Gray's research in, in the UK which very interestingly found that families under stress valued what they termed emotional labour um, provided by volunteers. And essentially what they were talking about was uh, someone who was there, who was willing to listen, who was willing, who cared, um, who understood what they were going through and tried to understand the circumstances that they were faced with, and who was willing to befriend them. You know, so very much, I suppose, the, the type of support that's provided by uh, the Big Brothers, Big Sisters and by the WOW volunteers. Both dispositional and organisational factors are key to recruitment and retention of volunteers. So right through... Uh, from motivating volunteers uh, to, you know, to become involved in the first place, to recruiting them successfully, and then to retaining them within the programme. Um, you know, there's, I suppose, a variety of dispositional and organisational factors that need to work together to ensure that that happens again successfully. To be successful, volunteer-led programmes need to be well organised, resourced and supported. So it's not that volunteers are just going to turn up and, and, and get on with the job without high-quality support, supervision and training, as we've illustrated. And lastly, then, this form of service provision should be seen as complementary and value-adding, um, as opposed to really replacing the more professional uh, service-led, or the more professional services. So, you know, that it, it complements and it adds value um, rather than being put in place instead of. And that's it. Shane.